Good morning. It's uh, time to begin our program. I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Stanford Economics Department and the Stanford Institute uh, for Economic Policy Research to the Arrow Tribute. We are here today to celebrate Ken Arrow's singular contributions to the field of economics. Uh, we are reminded of his foundational influence on a daily basis in our research and in our teaching, and through the contribution of the many brilliant scholars that he both trained and inspired. Uh, in a word, Ken was the embodiment of our field. When he passed early this year, uh, we knew as a department that we had to do something special to commemorate his life and work, but it wasn't obvious what that thing should be. So I did what all self-respecting department chairs would do when faced with a difficult decision, which was appoint a committee. Uh, the committee consisted of Al Roth, John Chauvin, and Matt Jackson, and the three of them came up with the wonderful idea of organizing this conference. Uh, to appreciate the reverence that Ken inspired, I think you only have to look around you in this room. Uh, the group of scholars who've come here today to honor Ken's contributions is um, truly extraordinary. Uh, I honestly can't recall another gathering uh, that has brought together so many of the profession stars in the same place at the same time. Um, as you can imagine, a conference such as this is, is not an inexpensive undertaking and we're grateful not only to the president and provost of Stanford University, uh, but also to the Hewlett Foundation for generously providing the necessary funding. And I'm joined up here today by Larry Kramer, who's the president of the Hewlett Foundation uh, as well as a former dean of Stanford Law School, who is going to say a few words of welcome, uh, followed by Al Roth, who will introduce the program. Larry. <laughs> so th thank you, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have the chance just to say a few words. Um, I, I will say, I said to John, I actually had no idea. This is undoubtedly the most intimidating audience I've ever, see I'm nervous, ever actually had to speak to. Um, and in fact, I mean, I will say that the audience itself is in some ways the, the best conceivable tribute uh, that, that is possible for Ken Arrow. Um, I, I wanted the chance to do it partly because um, when I was at Stanford, I did get the opportunity uh, to know and work with Ken in a number of contexts, not the same kind of professional context as most of you, but, but I did get the chance to experience all those other sides of him uh, that Doug touched on, his humanity, his openness, his supportiveness um, in work on the Ethics Center and just a, a whole variety of other things. Um, mostly I was privileged just by virtue of being uh, at the Hewlett Foundation to have the opportunity to support Ken uh, and his work. And even as the foundation's own work drifted into other directions, uh, we always continued to support Ken because, you, how could you say no? Um, and so the, the, the chance to support whatever work he was doing was really a privilege uh, for us. Um, when, when he passed, uh, he had an outstanding grant that was uh, uh, only partly spent. Uh, and so when John called and said, you know, can we use it to, for an event like this, that it was an easy, easy answer and a no-brainer, and, and again, the opportunity to celebrate him uh, and to have all of you here to do it is, is a great tribute to him, a privilege and honor for us. So welcome and thank you and uh, look forward to an amazing day. Well, many of us here are going to miss Ken uh, unexpectedly you know, at odd times in the years to come. But our job today is not to miss him, but to celebrate him. And for those of us who work in economics, he will always be present because we work in the edifice that he constructed. So our topics today, the, the setting up the program was hard because Ken touched every aspect of economics. There'll be uh, particular panels on social choice and general equilibrium and health economics and finance and teaching. Uh, not only was Ken the, is Ken still the youngest Nobel Prize winner to date, but four of his students also 
won Nobel Prizes, and, and some of them are here. Uh, and then there'll also be personal reminiscences throughout the day, and, and some panels and talks on his more general contributions. So uh, it's going to be a busy day. Uh, I'm supposed to urge everyone to pay attention to the time limits when they speak and when they come back from the, uh, the breaks. And what we're going to do first, though, is, is take note of the Nobel Prize that was awarded today to Dick Thaler for his contributions to behavioral economics. And uh, Doug Bernheim is going to speak about that, and so is Vic Fuchs. Thank you. Now, um, of course, uh, we haven't had much warning. Uh, <laughs> having only just learned about uh, the, uh, uh, the award this morning, uh, I, I said as I arrived here that uh, I really wish I had another hour to prepare this, uh, at which point Al pointed out that according to Dick's theories, I would have just waited the hour anyway. Uh, I have found it absolutely fascinating to follow the arc of Dick Thaler's career over the course of several decades. When I started paying attention to behavioral economics, which was in the early 1980s, uh, it was very much a fringe field. Uh, Thaler was by far its most visible champion. Uh, these days, many of the ideas from behavioral economics, and we can tick off some of them, uh, for example, uh, time and consistency, fairness, these sorts of ideas have found their way into the mainstream of economic thought. And in fact, this is now the second Nobel Prize uh, that we've seen in this area, the first, of course, going to Danny Kahneman. Uh, so it's easy to forget that in the later 1970s and early 1980s, uh, most economists did not take this field seriously, and that reactions commonly included um, a degree of eye-rolling, uh, if not outright derision in some instances. Now, Kahneman did his work from the relative safety of a psychology department where there was an insatiable appetite for making fun of the rational actor model. Uh, in contrast, Thaler was an economist. His colleagues were economists. He published his work in economic journals, often over considerable resistance. He attended economics conferences, which is where I met him in the early 1980s. And intellectually speaking, he had very, very few allies at the beginning. Uh, to stay the course in those early days and to follow his conviction that economic analysis needed to be enriched with insights from psychology was an act of considerable courage for which I personally admire him greatly. Uh, given the resistance he encountered to his work early on, uh, it would have been easy for him to become combative or defensive. Um, however, he was even in those years unfailingly good-natured and even jovial. Uh, he made criticisms of the standard model with good humor. Uh, he told stories, he joked around, he cajoled. He asked us with a sly smile whether we really believed all the strong assumptions we were packing into our models. And ever so slowly, uh, we began to come around. Now, the dam eventually began to break in the 1990s as a new generation of behavioral economists such as Colin Kammerer, George Lowenstein, David Labson, and Matthew Rabin rose to prominence. Uh, and all of them speak fondly and with considerable gratitude uh, for their debt to Dick for blazing uh, the path. Uh, without which uh, they would not have been in a position to do what they did. Uh, when we were thinking about uh, having this brief discussion of the new Nobel laureate this morning, uh, we agreed that the speaker, whoever it turned out to be, I, I drew the lottery ticket here, uh, would, have, would give a brief summary of the individual's work. So I'm going to uh, do my best to say a few words about Dick's many contributions, emphasizing 
that I am doing this on very short notice, so I will no doubt commit some errors and omissions here. Um, some of Thaler's earliest work was on the topic of temptation, work that he did with Hirsch Uh The two of them together envisioned a dual self model of decision making, where inside of each one of us is the rational actor, which they called the planner, uh, as well as another motivational entity, if you will, that they labeled the doer. The doer being present focus, the doer wanting immediate gratification. And in their model, the planner could exercise control over the doer, uh, but only at a cost. And this was the first economic model of willpower. Um, the influence of that early work has been felt in multiple ways. You can see it in modern theories of temptation, for example, the work of Gould and Pessendorfer and Fudenberg and Levine. Uh, both of those strands of work lean very heavily uh, conceptually on the uh, Thaler and Schefferin structure. On a more general level, uh, that work introduced the idea of multi-self models to economists. There was some familiar familiarity with the idea of the multi-self perspective from the work of Strauss in the context of time inconsistency. Um, but those scale selves were scattered through time, and this was the first work that took seriously the idea that uh, people have these motivational conflicts that they don't necessarily work out uh, in a completely harmonious way. Another important contribution uh, that came out of this work was the idea that it's important to pay attention to what one might call internal goods, goods that we don't observe, but that in some sense, people are consuming inside their heads, like exercising willpower, like experiencing temptation. This was a very important insight because it, it gives a, a different perspective on phenomena like um, time inconsistency. Uh, think of the canonical case of time inconsistency where uh, you're making a decision about your lunch tomorrow and you can either choose salad or pizza. And today, choosing lunch for tomorrow, you say, I want to have salad because it's healthy. And then tomorrow, when tomorrow arrives, you say, well, that pizza seems pretty good, so I'm going to choose the pizza. And that's viewed as an inconsistency. And the tradition from Strauss would say that this is a manifestation of time inconsistency. And Dick Thaler said not so fast. That's not necessarily time inconsistency, because there are these things called internal goods. When we talk about choosing the pizza today, that is not the same good as, I'm sorry, the salad today. We, that is not the same good as choosing the salad tomorrow when the pizza is available because there's a second item in our consumption bundle and that's the degree of temptation that we experience and have to overcome when making the decision. Making the decision today, we don't have to overcome it. Making the decision tomorrow, we do. So you can take a phenomena that others have interpreted as manifesting time inconsistency and say that's not what it's about. It's about the importance of these um, internal goods. From a practical perspective, that early work had the greatest influence on thinking about personal saving and policies affecting personal saving. Um, so it led very naturally to the question of how do people exercise self-control? How do they overcome these problems of, of being tempted, of wanting immediate gratification? An important idea that emerged in uh, Dick Thaler's work was the idea of mental accounting. Uh, the simple illustration of mental accounting that he liked to give is one where you are going to a theater and in one scenario you've purchased a ticket in advance and you lose the ticket before arising, arriving at the theater. The other where you have put the amount of money to purchase the ticket uh, in your wallet and you lose the money instead. And he argued that in the first instance a lot of people would be inclined to say, well, okay, then I'm not going to go to the show because I've lost the ticket, even though other tickets might be available. But in the other case, uh, you would go to the show because you've lost the money and the money isn't somehow connected uh, so much to the uh, show uh, at that point. So uh, Thaler popularized the notion that we segment our resources psychologically. Uh, in this example that we have perhaps a general account and an entertainment account or an evening account, and that as a result, uh, in fact, our resources are not as fungible across different categories of spending as we think they are. And that there might, for example, be very different marginal propensities to consume out of different types of income. Uh, this became an important 
an influential idea. Uh, and it led to, as well, practical policy prescriptions. So an important implication of his work on temptation and self-control is that it's easier to choose to save when we do it in advance rather than in the moment because when we do it in advance, we are avoiding the temptation. The, the doer in his model does not have uh, an interest in those types of decisions. You can think about this in the context of the pizza and salad example. It's easy to choose the salad tomorrow if we choose it now. It's harder to choose the salad tomorrow if we're actually choosing in the moment uh, when the pizza is available. So for example, uh, Dick developed this notion of uh, save tomorrow. Uh, which is an option that employers can use to offer their employees with the opportunity of committing to increases in their pension fund contributions as their income rises. They commit to that in advance, and he's presented some evidence uh, of the effectiveness of that. Turning to an entirely different topic, uh, Dick Thaler also gets credit for formulating what's known as the endowment effect the idea that we attach more value to things that we own for the simple reason that we own them. Uh, this was originally documented in the famous coffee mug experiments where you have a group of students, half of them are given coffee mugs, half of them are not. And you assess the willingness to accept uh, for uh, the mugs that some are given and the willingness to pay for uh, mugs among the group that doesn't receive the mugs and you find uh, that these things uh, diverge by a ratio of two to one, even though standard theory would suggest uh, that they should be the same. Some interpret this as evidence of loss aversion, uh, but there are other interpretations. Uh, one interpretation is I value my endowment. I value the mug more because it is my mug. The other interpretation is that I, I now value mugness because I have a mug and attach greater value to mugs generally. And there's an interesting debate about that, and this has stimulated all sorts of additional work. One very interesting paper, uh, for example, by a psychologist, Dan Gilbert, has found that replicating that experiment when you take the people who are given mugs and offer them an opportunity to buy a second mug and assess the willingness to pay for the second mug that it too is inflated by about the same amount, which suggests that it's about valuing mugs more as opposed to valuing the mug that I own. Uh, in any case, the notion of the endowment effect has been hugely influential in behavioral economics. Now, Dick himself adopted the loss aversion interpretation uh, of the endowment effect, and he explored its implication, uh, implications in other areas, uh, most notably in financial markets. Uh, for example, he explored whether loss aversion can account for the equity premium puzzle. And you might think there could be a connection there. Uh, loss aversion, uh, which creates this uh, higher level of aversion to risks locally, uh, could be an explanation for why people are less willing to take, uh, make risky investments. And what he showed in his work is that while that can provide an explanation, it requires further behavioral assumptions about the narrowness with which people are psychologically framing uh, their um, investment decisions. Another big topic in behavioral economics these days is fairness. Social preferences generally, but fairness is a very important idea. And not surprisingly, when you trace the economic literature on fairness back to its origins, uh, you find uh, Dick, Dick Thaler is one of the people standing at the beginning. Uh, he uh, explored how fairness acts as a constraint on profit seeking in particular. For example, moderating the tendency to take advantage of opportunities to gouge. Uh, an example would be overcharging for gasoline after a hurricane. What moderates those, uh, those tendencies and are, are those factors important in markets? In recent years, uh, Dick has turned his attention most notably to the topic of nudges. And this notion begins with a very important idea in behavioral economics, which is the notion of frame dependence, or some people would say context dependence. The idea is that you can take the same economic decision problem, that is the same opportunity set, and offer it to someone in two different settings where nothing changes in their opportunities but their decision changes because of what's sometimes called the psychological framing 
uh, of the choice problem. Uh, Dick has noted that this phenomena can be thought of as uh, delivering to us a variety of policy levers because if we can change the choice architecture within which people are making decisions, if we can change the framing, we may be able to divert their decisions in more constructive directions. Examples of this include phenomena like default effects uh, in uh, 401k pension plans where it's well known that uh, people disproportionately tend to follow the default option that a, a plan names. Changing the default option does not change your opportunities in any meaningful way, but it does change decisions dramatically to a far greater degree, for example, than changing taxes, which people have spent a lot of time studying. Um, the work on, on nudges has had a demonstrable practical impact a huge impact on policy, direct impact on policy, uh, and you can, you can understand why. Governments love this idea because it's, uh, it, it points in directions where you can have an effect on the decisions that are pe people are making without much in the way of budgetary consequences since you, you're not really changing opportunity sets. Relative to subsidies, for example, this is very inexpensive. Uh, the British government a couple of years ago created a nudge unit to explore applications of this idea and the United States has since uh, followed suit. The notion of nudges is linked also to the notion of libertarian paternalism um, which uh, uh, Dick uh, contributed to the idea that we should try to modify behavior without compulsion doing that through changing the decision architecture, changing uh, the frames. Um, I think that uh, finally in, in summarizing uh, Dick's uh, contributions to economics, it's, it's perhaps most appropriate to quote from him directly. I did catch uh, the following quote which appeared this morning in the New York Times uh, when he was asked how he planned to spend his prize money, uh, Dick responded, as irrationally as possible. So thank you. I'm now going to turn uh, the podium over to Vic Fuchs, who would like to add a few words about Dick Thaler. Uh, thank you, uh, Doug. Uh, I believe you said you had only a short time to prepare. Uh, I'm in awe to think about what would happen if you had sufficient time to prepare. <laughs> But anyway, that was a, a marvelous summary, and I think everyone here can understand why you got tenure at Stanford. <laughs> uh, I have little advantage here in speaking after Doug, uh, except uh, that my uh, relationship with Dick goes back earlier. It goes back to the 1970s, uh, when John Meyer, in his wisdom, uh, set up an office of the National Bureau uh, out here in uh, California at Stanford. And uh, Sherwin Rosen, who had been a postdoctoral fellow at the National Bureau in New York, uh, recommended uh, a young fellow who had just done a dissertation with him uh, to have a postdoc uh, at uh, NBER out in California, and that was Dick Thaler. And I had some uh, administrative responsibilities for the office, and so uh, we became friendly through uh, the nexus of money, as you said. Uh, anyway, uh, Dick, during the course of the year, uh, began to think about things different uh, than the value of life, which had been the subject of his work with uh, Sherwin. And it, it was, I think, very good work and one of the early attempts to uh, measure the value of life uh, by wage differentials, which were correlated uh, with the risk that people uh, faced in different types of occupations. And I think my, my long-term memory is generally better uh, than my short term, and I seem to remember introducing uh, Dick uh, to uh, Tversky and Kahneman. And uh, somehow or other, that, the, the ideas that they were promulgating 
uh, really clicked with Dick, and he went off on the work that eventually became his uh, uh, Nobel Prize winning uh, work. Now, the thing that I would most point out is the extent to which his early efforts uh, were met with ridicule, scorn, laughter. Sometimes he was fortunate enough to get just plain criticism. Uh, but I don't know if people here remember this. Some of you may have even uh, been the source of the uh, scorn <laughs> and ridicule. But uh, Dick took it all in reasonably good spirit. I think you, you conveyed that, Doug, that uh, he didn't react the way uh, uh, an economist would react, more like a, ho like a human. <laughs> and uh, he just kept working. And the thing that I would emphasize is the extent to which patience and persistence uh, characterized his work and his, his life and his career. In this respect, I, I disagree with uh, Kahneman. Kahneman, in print, has accused Thaler of being lazy and that he owes his success the fact uh, that he only works on things that are important and that he has something to say about. That was what his idea of, but that was wrong. I, I saw uh, Dick then, and I've seen him many times since then, and I would say that you should encourage your students uh, to take Dick's example to heart, uh, that somebody believes strongly in something and is willing to put a lot of work into it and has patience and has persistence, it does, at least for some, eventually pay off. And, that, and that's all that I'll say this morning. Thank you. <laughs>